You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. The Planet Fitness Black Card is packed with perks, not like other gyms. Hi, can I bring a friend to work out? Oh, okay. Is my membership good at other locations? Okay. Do you have any other amenities? But at Planet Fitness, the PF Black Card gets you tons of perks. Bring a friend for free anytime. Access to any of our 2,500 plus locations. Relax in the hydro massage and so much more. Join for just $1 down, $24.99 a month. Cancel anytime. Deal ends March 15th. See Home Club for details. Hello, delicious friends. The episode you are about to hear was supposed to be released pre-Christmas 2023, but as you are about to hear, uh, there were circumstances beyond my control which led to this not being released on time, so I hope you'll enjoy this festive-themed, panto-esque episode. And apologies uh, if I'm wheezing, I still have, you know, the pneumonia and... Uh, it's getting there. I'm I'm on medication. Everything is is, you know, going the way it should be. But I hope you enjoy this episode and I am so sorry for the delay. <laughs> Hi everybody and welcome to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class. With me, your host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. Now, gentle listeners, I love you so much. I really do. And um, I got some really, really cute reviews in. Um, so that's wonderful. Love that. You're, you're wonderful. You've really brightened up my weekend. Because, gentle listeners... I have been beset upon by a series of calamities. I thought the worst part of my week was going to be the fact that a wonderful follower of the podcast had sent me in a link to a Clarabelle the Cow bag. Like it's a Disney lounge fly collaboration. It's gorgeous. It's perfect. It's amazing. But it's only available in the US and I can't buy it. So I was like, oh no. You know, I thought, you know, it's, the 100 year anniversary, it's limited edition, it's like reduced now because it's coming to the end of the year and I was like, oh, oh no, I can't buy it. And I thought, that's sad. You know, that'll be, that'll be the worst part of my weekend, right? <laughs> right? No, 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 no. So I had a friend come in and I was seeing them before I was heading away for the weekend and their glasses were all wonky and I was like, oh, let me fix that for you because I'm always fixing my own frames, right? And um, completely snap the leg off. Just gone. Schnip, schnip, gone. Broke them. So now I've got to try and get them soldered because I'm a fucking arse. Like, so that's happened. And I was getting ready to travel to Belfast to see my friend because we'd been arranging to go to the markets. Like, we'd planned this for yonks. We were supposed to go the weekend after my birthday. But they were dealing with some stuff. And I was dealing with some stuff and a bunch of things happened in between so we couldn't do that. So like this was the only time because um, I pick up the kids. Well, turns out the kids actually ended up at my house anyway. But that's neither here nor there. So yeah, and I was going to Belfast and turns out the day I'm planning to travel, there is a strike. And I'm all for strikes. I'm here for it. So, like, Northern Ireland, all of the rail and bus services are on strike. You know, fair enough. Get your wages, get your, you know, the stuff you need. And so I'm like, okay. And I decide, there's a coach from the south, from the Republic, that goes from Donegal all the way over to Belfast. I was like, I'll get the coach. So I'd managed to come around this. All goes well, 
everything in Belfast is fine. I'm planning to do like recording and stuff. I end up just like putting all notes on my wee travel laptop. And I've got my Kraken Kitty like headset because it's got a microphone in it. And I'm like, oh, this will be so much easier. Plus, if I manage to get any of my pals that were looking to do some collabs, if I can get them in, I can get the recording done. It'll all be fab. Skip to me being in the bus station, as I'm getting like the regular bus, the gold line, from Belfast to Derry. And I'm waiting for my bus. And two buses with the same number, both gold line, both 212, show up. And I'm like, oh, which bus is the right bus? And people are asking me which bus is the right bus. Anyway, I've got my bags in my hands and stuff. I've got my backpack and I've got my phone with my ticket on it. And, you know, we found out which bus is the right bus when we get on the right bus. As we approach Derry, I realise I left my fucking suitcase in Belfast at the bus station. Mm-hmm. I'm very proud of myself for not crying because it's got my laptop. It has my headphones. It has my ring light. It has my red dress My beautiful red dress from the podcast awards because I was going to film in it. I had great plans because I was going to film tonight, or tonight, but last night when I got back. So I get back and um, I'm trying to call the service. The lost property is closed on Sundays. So I managed to speak to somebody who goes, well, if the suitcase is there, it's going to be locked in somebody's office. So you could have phone us at quarter past eight in the morning to find out. So currently I've got Schrodinger's suitcase. Is it there? Is it not? Have I lost a bunch of stuff? Have I lost the gifts I bought my kids at the Belfast market? I guess. So in Derry, luckily enough, I've got sterling's like British money. and Because my dad always sends me, I send it for the kids and I give them the euro equivalent and then I take it so that I can use it when I go to these places. And what do I do? I go in to... <laughs> I went to Penny's, Primark, whatever you want to call it, and I buy underwear and pajamas and a toothbrush and all the other essentials. And that's that's great. That's great. It's great. It's great. And so then, the next thing I do is I get to Letter Kenny and I get off the bus and I start walking. And what have I done? I've left the Penny's bag on the bus because at this point. I'm just panicking. Uh, Clearly my brain is not working at this point. So I have to run back. Luckily no one's touched it and I grab my bag and I take it with me. So again, solutions, it's fine. Then I get to the hotel, everything's fine. And they're like, oh, you don't have a case because they know me at this hotel. Um, I stay here all the time just because it's like so convenient for where I need to be. And... I'm in my room last night and I'm like, oh, you know what? I can do some recording on my phone. Like, that'll be fine. I'll record on my phone. But whatever way the walls in this particular hotel are, they are so thin. So I got to listen to an entire conversation by a couple, followed by the many, many times that they were um, active. Now, I'm not here to yuck anybody's yum, and I know, you know, love your best life, but hotels, hotels. Now, it is absolutely the hotel's fault for not having thicker walls, for not soundproofing. Like, the hotel that I was staying in in Belfast had a club in it, right? A club downstairs. I barely heard anything. They did have earplugs, which was nice, but I wasn't bothered by any of it. Like, I couldn't hear anybody else's rooms. I couldn't hear anything else. It was, like, sturdy, right? Hotels should have thicker walls. I should not be able to hear the conversation of the family next door or the couple in the other room. Like, I shouldn't hear that. Like, that is just per structural things. But yeah, so that's that's kind of stopped me from being able to do anything. So I ended up just putting uh, my ear plugs and ear, ear plugs, earbuds in, listening to a podcast and and playing a Myrtle book. That, that's what I ended up doing instead of recording because I was like, I can't, I just can't deal with this right now. This is not working. <laughs> so yeah, 
that was fun. Um, but I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, quit your jibber jabber. In fact, me. In fact, you, I will. But first, we've got to get our source on. Our sources are History of Sir Richard Whittington by Henry B. Wheatley, Richard Whittington by C. Rockcliffe, Citizen of London, Richard Whittington, The Boy Who Would Be Mayor by Michael McCarthy, History of Parliament, House of Commons, 1386 to 1421, and of course our favourites, History.com and Biography.com. Also, um, every single panto that I have ever seen regarding Dick Whittington. <laughs> Are you sitting comfortably? Good, then let's begin. I know you may be thinking to yourself, Katie, why are you talking about men from history two weeks in a row? You don't do this. You're right, I don't. But I was thinking of trying to do something a bit more festive. Because when I was wee and I was living in Scotland, we would go to pantomimes like my aunt and stuff. Like she was very involved in sort of drama. And like and when I went back to college, I actually used to write and direct pantos. Like I keep forgetting I do it. Do you ever get like a part of your life you just forget happened and then you're reminded of it and you're like, oh yeah, I did that. So yeah, I used to write and direct pantos. And pantomime culture is like a very big, a very big thing. It used to be all over Europe and pantomime shows originally back in the day were like hours long. They would have acrobats and, you know, vaudeville and like all these different parts to it. And then it becomes shortened down to this sort of two act play and it's a sort of comedy play like a parody but for family like a family friendly parody generally of old sort of fairy tales folklore things like that you know or folk tales even and there is one panto uh it's behind you what it's a whole thing there there's a call and response situation and, and it's it's fun it's just fun for all of my american listeners who have asked me about pantos, that, that's a pantomime, right? So there's a very popular pantomime which comes from a tale of the boy, a rag to riches story. It's like really good. It is Dick Whittington, who shows up in London, broke as shit. He's got his wee stick with a cloth in the back, like a bindle. I think it's called a bindle. It's him and his cat. And he goes to London because he is told the streets are paved with gold. And he goes there to make his fortune and he becomes the thrice time mayor of London. And it's this sort of folk tale-ish situation. And, you know, there, there's a pantomime dame and there's a principal boy and a bunch of other stuff kind of happens, you know. And it can vary. But effectively, he becomes mayor three times which is kind of a big deal um and it's also kind of wrong because he was mayor four times because dick whittington was mayor of london dick whittington did arrive in london as a boy but the story is a wee bit different to you know the fun family friendly comedy that we tell children it's actually still not a bad story like there's nothing inherently dodgy about it but I think the real life of Dick Whittington is just as interesting as the panto that is based on. So let's get into it. We're going to start at the beginning, shall we? So Dick Whittington, which is what I'm going to call him because that's what I know him as. And Dick is short for Richard, so any excuse really, to be honest. So Dick Whittington is born around about 1358 in Gloucestershire and yeah how do I put this he's not he's not a poor man like in the panto he is a poor boy nobody loves him when in fact he is from the gentry he's from a relatively a relatively all right family yeah he's effectively Gloucester nobility ish well not nobility he's getting there so he is born to Sir William Whittington of Pontley and Joan Monsell. So his mother is the daughter of a, an MP, which is a member of Parliament, which is the politician. 
and his father was a member of parliament. Um, so yeah, yeah, they, he, he came from a family of politicians and his dad had an estate and he had two older brothers, Robert Whittington and William Whittington. Now, Robert um, ends up being an MP for Gloucester. Like, he becomes an MP. And his other brother, William, also becomes an MP. So they all go into politics, which is, like, funny. So, I mean, it's not that funny. Because around about the time that he is born, his father dies that same year. So his mother, Joan, is widowed. But Joan is not a fool. Like, she is a smart one because what she does is she keeps her connections. Like, she's smart enough to do it because she's very lucky that she has, you know, this gentry, you know, surrounding her and that she inherits, like, part of an estate as a widow. Now, Richard, being the youngest... The youngest of three sons, especially. Now, being the youngest of three sons, well, three sons especially, Richard here, we dick, he was not going to benefit from primogeniture, which is effectively inheritance. Like, so it, it's about heritage and inheritance. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a big deal. So his oldest brother is clearly going to inherit, and then the second brother will get something... But being the third, there's, like, nothing for him unless his brother wants to, like, keep him, effectively. And so, uh, as someone who is not going to inherit his father's estate, unless he, you know, uh, manages to outlive both of his siblings, who also don't have any children, like, yeah, both of his brothers would have to die and not have any, like, legitimate heirs in order for Dick to inherit anything. So yeah, off he pops to London. His mother sends him to London in order for him to learn a trade. Because round about the age 10 or 12 is typically the age that a boy in this era would go and start apprenticing. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, But more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes, even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead, and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera but this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. Bet like the pros with the world's largest sports book right at your fingertips. The Circa Sports app is now available in Illinois. Sports betting the way it should be. Now you can download, fund, and bet like a pro from anywhere in Illinois Download your new bookie today at circusports.com. Circusports.com. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, call 1 800 Gambler or text I L G A M B to 833 234. And Dick here gets a Mercer apprenticeship under Ivo Fitzwarren. Sorry, Sir Ivo Fitzwarren, who is a knight, obviously, because he is a Sir and he is a Mercer. What the fuck is a Melsa? A merchant, effectively, but he traded in fine goods, so luxury items. So he would trade luxury goods. So he would be trading silks and velvets. These he would sell to the nobility in England, and he would also sell 
British wool, especially like broadcloth, which would be like finished and then sent off to like Florence and stuff. So he would trade in luxury goods and he was doing quite well. Luckily for him, because as a young boy coming into London at this time period in sort of the mid to late 1300s, like this is around about the end of the Hundred Years' War, which, you know, helped people gain and maintain titles, but also brought them in a chunk of change. So people were well off, like they were doing well from this. And because he is young, right, this is London, which is still recovering from the Black Death. So they lost so many people from that, that when you've got youth coming in and that youth has a trade, like that's really going to benefit. Like he arrives in London at just the right time. To say the boy is lucky, like, I mean, losing your father is not like the best of situations, but like from an employment standpoint, you know, he's doing really well. Like he has landed in London, very much right person, right place, right time. And on top of that, he has these family connections, which I don't even think he was too sure of at the time, but he had all of these connections to sort of gentry and the military, which again, after the Hundred Years' War, pretty good to know these people who've earned money from this. So yeah, he has these really good connections and he is doing very, very well. And by the time he's 26, he becomes a councilman of the city of London. It seems to be that he wasn't too interested in getting involved in politics. It just kind of happened because of the circles he was in. Now Dick, as it turns out, is smart enough to know that one does not put all of their eggs in one basket. So as he's making, you know, a fuck ton of money, he's doing really, really well for himself. What he starts doing is he, you know, starts looking into other business opportunities and he ends up becoming a money lender. So like a lot of people would buy property and do things like that and would have an outward show of wealth. Like he wasn't big on like showing people he had money. Like he was like pretty religious. He was a very pious dude. And so he wasn't really, he wasn't really into showing and flashing the cash. So he ends up going into money lending instead. By the time Dick Whittington is 28, he has infiltrated the royal court and he is selling his luxury goods. He is mercering, or whatever, to King Richard II. Like, he is selling shit to the king. And, like, four years after that, he's actually loaning the king money. Now, how wealthy do you have to be that the king is borrowing coins from you? Like, that is, that is some good trading. That's all I'm saying. So in 1392, you know, uh, the king isn't quite pleased because uh, he believes the city of London, um, I think we discussed this before, that there are two Londons. There's, like, London and then the city of London. So the city of London, hmm, Things are not going well because the king is convinced that the government is mismanaging shit. And he is, for lack of a better term, um, generally unhappy. So he literally seizes the city of London's lands. And Dick Whittington here is appointed sheriff of the city of London by the mayor, William Staunton. So, this is while he also becomes a member of the Worshipful Company of Mercers. So, like, it's all going on. He's joining this. He's joining that. And he's doing this. Things are, things are sort of him ending up pushed more into politics. Uh, just as, well, how to put this? Uh, just, again, lucky, I guess. <laughs> I think the difference between sort of choosing to enter politics sometimes and ending up in politics, just, 
I don't know. I don't, I don't know what it says about a person because some politicians go into politics to do good and they should because you work for the fucking people. I'm a firm believer that if a representative does not do their job, that we fire them and they lose money and they have to pay fines. And I have many, many opinions on that. But anyway, <laughs> back to Dick. So when he's 39 years old, the current mayor of London, Adam Bam, dies. And two days later, the king is like, you know what? You're mayor now. And that is how Dick Whittington becomes mayor of London for the first time. Now, I've seen notes say that it's Lord Mayor of London, but at this time, there was no Lord Mayor of London. You were just mayor, not Lord Mayor, just mayor. So he was Mayor of London. So a couple of days into being Mayor of London, Dick Whittington brokers a deal with the fucking king. And what does he do? Well, I'll tell you what he does. He manages to negotiate sort of getting the lands back, the liberties, you know, the stuff the king had seized from the city of London. Like, he gets that back. Which, you know, as things go, pretty good, pretty good deal. So he manages to get back everything for, what was it, £10,000? Which, in today's money, is about £8 million. And basically the city of London is well happy about this. They are very thankful. Everyone knows that he's a generally good dude. Which is when the re-election happens later that year. Like uh, like, four months later or whatever. He is voted back in as mayor of London. So he sort of becomes it first. And then he's voted in a second time. Now... Two years after this, King Richard II is, uh, well, um, there's, there's a, there's a coup by Bolingbroke and, you know, this leads to Richard II, you know, losing, losing the crown, losing his status and, um, being deposed effectively. And you'd think that with everything going on and the fact that he had initially put Dick Whittington in there, and that he'd been the one to loan a bunch of money to the king. Well, you would think that, you know, he would also, you know, I'm not going to say be on the chopping block, but like he would also be on the way out. No. Because uh, he had also been trading with the future King Henry the Fourth, So he had been trading with him for a long time and... He'd been a moneylender to him. So when King Henry comes on the scene, again, Dick just so happens to be the sharpest tool in the cutlery drawer. And he is loaning Henry IV money. Because of course he is. He's like, you need some cash, buddy? I got you. And so he is helping him out and also securing his place. And I think as well, because Dick Whittington was so well-liked in sort of, sort of the court and the outward gentry and like the general population of the city of London, doing something to him probably wouldn't have been good for your reputation. So in his 40s, Dick gets elected as mayor again. So 1406, he's mayor again. And then takes a wee break from being mayor because, you know, life's a bit of variety and whatnot. And he ends up getting married. So he's... 48, I think, and he ends up marrying Alice Fitzwarren, the daughter of the dude, the knight that he was apprenticing from. So they get married. You know, at this point in life, he would have been expected to get married, but he didn't seem to show any interest to, like, most people, (laughs) like, one way or the other. Like, there's no rumours of anything. And him and his wife... They don't have any kids. So he never remarries. He never does anything else because she actually passes away in 1411. So they're married for a very short period of time. And they are, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe he was asexual. I mean, these are things that we can't really guess about him. 
um, maybe he got married because she needed to be married at that point. We don't know the sort of intricacies or the reasonings why their marriage occurred. It's a very advantageous match. It's a decent match. And he seems like a decent guy. So, I mean, good for them. Glad they got married. But um, it does mean, for the record, that Dick Whittington like, is the last of his particular line. Like, he doesn't produce any heirs like his brothers do. But he doesn't. And this is going to come into play later on. So, a year after being elected mayor of London, he, 1406, so the year after that, 1407, he becomes the mayor at the staple of Calais. Now, the staple is basically a port with, um, sort of, to do with importation and taxation and all that kind of, like, trade stuff. And so he represents, you know, town, because Calais at this point was still part of of Britain, effectively, of England. It was owned by that because, uh, because of all the Henrys. Anyway, you remember the episode of Eleanor of Aquitaine, don't you? I'm sure you do. Anyway, so he is basically dealing with taxation, importing goods, exporting goods, yada, yada, yada. And so he's doing stuff, he's doing trading, he's doing money lending, and he's also getting involved in public projects. Now, along with this, he manages to get on the good side of another king, Henry V, who is Henry IV's son. So he manages to get in good with three kings in a row. And he's still trading, he's still doing well, he's still working his circles. But he's not being a dick about it, which is the funniest thing, considering, you know. And yes, he is serving on the Royal Commissions of Oyer and Terminer. And so he's like supervising the way they're spending money on Westminster Abbey. And even though he is a money lender himself, even though Dick Whittington is, you know, I don't want to say a loan shark, because like sometimes he wouldn't make people pay him back like the whole amount, like he would just kind of let it slide because he knew where to build those bridges and, you know, not to burn them as one does. So he's doing this and he, and he ends up being brought in to like deal with disputes and negotiations and broker this and sort out that. So look, like, there's this um like big massive issue with the worshipful worshipful company of brewers, right? So like there's no standardized pricing for booze. So ale, mead, and like the measures of it, like there's no standardized pricing, and so people were getting ripped off here and done there, and Dick Whittington manages to sort all this out, right? Which I think is just he sorted out booze. That's nice. But yeah. So he's, he's doing this thing, and by 1419, so this is a good, you know, 13 years after he's been elected mayor, like, as a good chunk of time has passed, he gets elected as mayor again. Like, he just keeps, he just keeps falling into roses. Like, the dude just keeps falling up. So yeah, yet again, the city of London, the citizens of the city of London... They elect him mayor again. And yeah, I guess he's doing well, you know, and he's a widower at this point as well. And he is just working, working, working. But while he's working, he's always putting together his will. Because at the age of 65, which, a fair age by the way, Dick Whittington, Richard Whittington, former mayor of London, four times by the way, not thrice, passes away. And he was buried in the church of St. Michael Paternoster Royal. And there's supposed to be, like, a tomb there. And, yeah, it, they can't find it. They don't know where he is anymore. I mean, it has been 600 years, so it's been a while. But, yeah, he manages to put together this will. And in it, he has all of this. I mean, he's a millionaire, effectively. Like, think of this as the equivalent of a millionaire. And he bequeaths this money. And he leaves it to the Mercers, like the Guild of Mercers. And it basically says to rebuild like Newgate Prison and the Old Bailey, um, to build the first library in the Guild Hall, to create um, almhouses. So basically places for the poor to go where they can get help. Because again, deeply pious dude, like an actually pious dude. Not the people who say they like religion and then end up being cunts. So he gets drinking fountains installed and he gets basically almhouses for women. 
like not just you know women who have been you know left by men sort of fallen women as you will but you've got sort of there are wars going on people are married to knights and soldiers and everything else and so and there's disease so people die from disease people die from war and so this was set up to help them but what he also does is he puts a stipulation in his will that you know you don't have to hold this to like the letter because I am fully aware that other things will come up and other things that will happen that I won't have assumed or prepared for and as such put the money towards good deeds like that. And then sort of the good deeds of Dick Whittington are sort of filtered down through generations and it's what leads to the folk tale of Dick Whittington and his cat. And so he stops becoming a member of the gentry and starts becoming like just another like poor rags to riches tale, which is a better sell, obviously, but it is. And uh, we can't actually guarantee whether or not he had a cat. We're not sure if Dick Whittington had a cat. I know the tale is Dick Whittington and his cat, but we're not entirely sure of that. That being said, it's... A tale of a good man. I know actually a good man in history. You're shocked. I'm shocked. And this is the story of Richard Dick Whittington, Mayor of London. If you liked my retelling of this story, please feel free to rate and review five stars. Um, you can catch me on threads now. Um, whatever Twitter was. I'm kind of there. Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. I'm all the places. So check me out there. And recommendations, I am going to recommend A Murder is Announced by Agatha Christie for reading. For listening, I'm going to suggest the entire Taylor Swift discography because I'm in that mood. Or listen to Christmas songs if that's your jam. I'm not going to push it this week. And for watching, um, anything with the Muppets actually. I'm back on the Muppets. Go watch it. Have a good time. And so I shall bid you farewell. Adios. Au revoir. Au revoir, my friends. Bye-bye.